Hey everyone, it's Red Wagner. This week's episode is on ideology. It's actually our second episode this season on that topic. Our first one came out in August. You can go back and listen to it now if you like. It's not required for this upcoming episode, the one that you're listening to right now. In this episode, we discuss Slavoj Žižek's movie, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology. Tony, Thad, and I talk about all of these different ways that ideology functions. And if there's one thing that really pulls in all of the different parts of our discussion, it's this theme, that ideology is sneaky. It works in ways that you don't necessarily think about at first. And and as you talk about it, and as you dig deeper and study it more, you keep pulling back these additional layers, more things that ideology does or controls or contributes to, and, and more things that it interacts with. This will be the first part of our discussion on the movie. The second half will be posted as an episode probably later this year. So with no further ado... Please enjoy the current episode, Ideology is Sneaky. Hello and welcome to Marks and Day. I'm Tony Schmidt. And I'm Red Wagner. And we are also joined today by the lovely... Thad Logan. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for calling me lovely. <laughs> You're welcome. I thought I looked kind of good today. It made me feel very good about myself. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and today we are going to be continuing our discussion that we started... Uh, bit ago on uh, ideology. And uh, this time, uh, we all sat down and watched Slava Zizek, and anyone feel free to correct that pronunciation, because I'm sure it's wrong. <laughs> um, we watched the Pervert's Guide to Ideology that he did. You pronounce the J. I mean, you can pronounce it, but it's got to be like a Y. Like Slavi? <laughs> Slavoy. Slavoy. Oh, Slavoy. Oh. I'm just going to say Zizek. Okay. Is that okay? I'm uh, Speaking in words is not... The big Z. Yeah. He's a good guy. Z-Man. <laughs> yeah. I like that. That's probably his superhero name. I think he portrays... He, he has, like, superhero powers in this movie, too, because he's, like, teleporting into these stories. Mm. It's something I noticed right off the bat... Um, as we go, as we start talking about this, but that he made a very conscious choice to dress up like the like he would be in the movies himself, talking about them from within. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know what that says about that choice. Maybe just like it, it made it feel like he was looking at it from the inside instead of like a professor lecturing at you. Like it, it gave it a sense of I don't know depth or intimacy. And maybe that's a superficial like stylistic choice. Um, but it was a choice he made, for sure. Like, he could have just been sitting in a room, and oftentimes he was, but they made a clear point, and sometimes to hilarious effect, uh, to have him, like, in the movie. I yeah. agree, and I think that this choice came from his earlier film, which is called Zizek! Exclamation point. Oh, man. And the director of that film did something where she wanted to have him in all of these different situations. You know, he could just be a talking head mm -hmm. and talk to you for two hours or however long the movie is. Yeah. Uh, but in Zizek, what she did is filmed him in his kitchen, in his bed. Like, <laughs> this. she filmed him just in all these, like, weird different places that are kind of part of his normal everyday life, uh, which was interesting. People liked that, I think. They mm -hmm. responded to the fact that, like, yeah, he's a philosopher, but he's not just this talking head. Mm-hmm. I think this was sort of the more magical version of that. Yeah, totally. You see him in a lot of different like garments. I think at one point he, maybe he's dressed as a priest or so, and in, di in different um, situations. And then it, it, they show Jaws, and I jokingly said, "Wouldn't it be awesome if they show him like doggy paddling with a little fin on his back, <laughs> <laughs> a little shark fin?" They really missed an opportunity. I know, there. It would have been fantastic. Well, so do we just want to so jump in? Maybe we should give a brief introduction to Zizek himself, yeah. in case people don't know. Mm -hmm. Slavoj Zizek. He is a Slovenian Marxist philosopher and also a Lacanian psychoanalytician? Psychoanalyst? Psychoanalyst? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. He, he's a, he, he draws a lot from... Uh, uh, a guy named Jacques Lacan, who was big into Freud, and he has a lot of 
really confusing concepts. <laughs> um, then the the one that comes up the most in this one, I think that and it isn't hard to understand is the Big Other, which is basically well, what it sounds like. It's you know a, a, a higher power or even while well, we can get into more about some of the other things that it could be, but yeah. Do you guys want to discuss a little bit of what you've already covered um, in reference to ideology? It'd be helpful to me. Maybe you just skim over where you've where you've come from. Yeah, our first episode on ideology, we talked about how you can divide the things that support a productive system into the repressive apparatuses and the ideological apparatuses. This is drawing from a theorist by the name of Althusser. Things like the police and the military would be the repressive apparatuses. These are things that are going to use force to reinforce the social system. So, for example, our social system, capitalism, says that the employer is the person who owns all of the products of the employee's labor. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how it works. And if an employee chooses to bring home the things that he has made while on the job, then that person can be arrested and jailed or whatever or taken to court. So you can call in force uh, in that sense. Mm -hmm. However, force on its own usually is not effective enough. And you need to have these things called ideological state apparatuses. The, and these are not limited just to things that the state does. We have a little spiel about that in the previous episode. Okay. Uh, but basically, it's all of the things that you would call ideology that support a social system. So it's how the schools work, it's how news is formatted, it's how politics works, it's how culture you know, what stories are the interesting stories, what movies get made, what mm -hmm. TV shows show up, what, what also, I, th I think in our culture, advertising is a massive part of, of ideology. And would you say that extends to just how people treat each other, the things that they, that they feel like treat as um, socially bad, like a value system that is reinforced or, or sort of written by just interactions with each other? Absolutely. Ideology taps into what is a good citizen. Mm. You know, it, it will define for you a ci good citizen has these characteristics. And in capitalism, you can see ideology in the sense of a good citizen is someone who works hard. Mm -hmm. Or um, a more modern, ex you know, that, that's been an example of, cap that, of capitalist ideology for a long time. Now, um, more recently in capitalism, a good citizen is also somebody who consumes to the correct level. Mm -hmm. uh, a person that, you know, lives uh, a life that requires them to work how uh, longer hours or more jobs or whatever. I think, too, part of that, since it was recently Veterans Day, pops into my head, is the ideology that you also have to support the repressive apparatuses and stuff, mm -hmm. like is with the Black Lives Matter stuff, people aren't keen when people are like, these cops are murdering people, or, you know... With, uh, war, they're not keen if you're like, well, why are the, why were these people fighting a war and killing? Like, is that something that should be universally praised? Like, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of stuff too. Yeah, and, and I think there's even more subtle ones, but they 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 get at this sort of connection, connective tissue between uh, like uh, values that individuals have and they think that they're their own, but they sort of are learned. They don't realize it, like. People would think I was weird if I didn't have a bank account. C certainly people in my family would think, well, that's odd. You should probably do that. That's what like a, a mature adult does. And in a lot of ways, that makes – I see the reason that the, the, on a practical side why that's there. But also, that's, that's sort of buying into a, a big – a lot of other baggage that you're not realizing you're buying into. Not only a bank account, but today it's the bank account and the credit card, and you need to build up good credit. You've mm -hmm. got to use that credit card. You've got to take out loans. Yeah, because there's yeah. this whole financial structure of our society that does provide real incentives for that, but then there's also like the the soft yeah. ideological portions of it as well, where it's just people th saying, "Oh, that's weird," or you know, "You really should," or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, in most jobs, you can't not have a bank account now. Most jobs only do direct deposit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so this leads me to the, the first, one of the first things in the movie. Is it cool if we jump in? Oh, yeah, totally. So the first movie he talks about, I think, is They Live. Yep. 
Okay. And if you're not familiar with this movie, it's about a man who receives glasses that allow him to see the true nature of the world. Um, and the true nature of the world is that there's, I think they're aliens that are running this, things behind the scenes, and at, um, everything is sort of a subliminal message to get you to be a better consumer, um, to, to obey, to, to buy. Um, it, like, he looks at billboards, and the billboard would just say, like that, like, obey, right? Or something like that. Or, um, and there's a lot of hokey, like, fighting in it. It's a pretty awesome yeah. movie. But uh, one of the things that Zizek talks about with that is that ideology is, is a spontaneous relationship to the world. It's not necessarily enforced. And that's sort of why I brought up this idea of, of this sort of soft ideology you were talking about. Because I think if any humans are together culturally, you're going to have an ideology form. And that was something I hadn't thought about before he said that. Mm -hmm. But... The point that it will exist spontaneously and that the, the, the fact that it um, takes place is not enforced does not mean that it is not used or manipulated in ways that are, are to enforce. Um, but uh, yeah, I just thought it was interesting to note that, that it is sort of a natural way that humans in a group interact with the world. I think related to that point is the fact that the movie makes a very good choice, a choice that Zizek calls out as the right choice, and I agree with him on this point, that the protagonist sees the truth not when he removes something, mm -hmm. which I think ties into the fact that there's always going to be some ideology. There's going to be some things that are valued, some things that are expected, whatever. There's going to be uh, a kind of ideology. And it's not that you need to clear something away to see the truth mm -hmm. behind the ideology. It's that you need to add something in order to see the full picture of the ideology that you're currently in. Yeah. So, so in the film and, and both, you know, it's very applicable to us because in the film, the, the, it's a modern uh, setting that's, I don't know, the 60s or whenever the film came out, 70s. Yeah. Uh, but the, clearly the people live in capitalist America. Mm -hmm. And uh, by putting on the glasses, that's a representation that you need a strong and well-developed theory to understand capitalism. That simply not being exposed to, you know, advertising and all of the other expectations of capitalism, it's not that you can, one, it's not that you can even be removed from all of those factors mm -hmm. and two even if you were removed from them that wouldn't help you understand how the ideology functions mm -hmm. it's the, this extra thing in the movie represented by glasses in real life being theory that right. helps you understand it it's a new way to look at the world as opposed to like it, 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 it could have been just um a sci-fi premise of like having a chip removed from your brain and you lose that and now you can see the world right but no there was a, a new apparatus he had to use like you said and what I what Zizek also pointed out was the extreme violence of liberation and that's a big part of what he talks about in the movie where in that th that theory that you're saying is the sort of key to unlocking your perspective and seeing things in a new way people are very comfortable without that key. Sometimes the ideology makes them feel very good, even though it's a lie. It makes them feel very at home, and they will be resistant to getting those glasses. And that, like, that happens in the, in the movie. There is a scene where two beefy dudes just like punch each other a bunch because one guy is trying to make him put the glasses on, and he just doesn't want to. Um, and and it's exactly that. And I think what he's saying, and I, I you know. I, I don't like using the word violence, but and I, I would sort of split hairs there and make sure that people are aware that being aggressive probably makes people less likely to understand the glasses, even if they put them on. They, they're more resistant. Mm -hmm. But I think the point that he was saying is you uh, communicating this, just like all those other things are communicated, it, the, the other parts of ideology are communicated, that the keys to unlock and see things can be communicated too. They can be given to one another. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people aren't going to be incredibly appreciative of the fact, but, you know, you can still work your damnedest to do it. And, you know, sometimes it's a struggle. Yeah, it's a very important part of the movie because it represents the struggle within the oppressed class to understand their own exploitation. Mm. Yeah. The, the, that's not something that can come, just like you said, automatically or, or freely, even if it is given. It's a struggle that needs to happen, and probably most effectively a struggle of ideas and words, but in the movie represented <laughs> by a, a just 
like you said, two beefy dudes just <laughs> slugging each other. In an alley over and over, just, yep. Um, I think I mentioned the Black Lives Matter uh, thing earlier, and I think that's a good modern contemporary example of that, is that there are people who see the big problems there are in the criminal justice system, and especially you know, how different people are treated uh, by the police. And like confronting people with that, like the mm. the the reactionary. That's the that's you know it's not actually violent, but it's the fighting against accepting this truth. Yeah, and and a lot of ridiculous ways, and like contorting themselves to uphold that. You know, because it's scary to think that you know if something bad happens, you want to be able to call the police mm -hmm. and have them take care of it. If somebody's breaking into your house, you want to be able to call the cops and know that the cops will come and arrest them yeah. and stop that. You don't want to be like, oh, I'm worried about something. I'm going to call the cops and they might kill me because. Mm -hmm. That's a terrifying narrative that the people who are there to protect you are really not necessarily going to protect you. And yeah. I'm not saying that that's exactly how it is. Um, but you know, like well, even it, just that they have motivations that are outside their advertised motivations that they're not necessarily there for your best interests um, at all times is yeah. Yeah, they don't have protect and serve tattooed to their soul. Mm -hmm. I like. Thank you for bringing up um, and like a real world, world example because I, wa when watching this, I felt like one of the things that would be the, the strongest addition to it is that sort of extension. And I don't think he could do it then. One, if he was using t timely examples for the time. It would uh, it would date the movie very quickly, mm -hmm. but two like what he does is is relate them to pop culture, and I think that's a great framework to do so because there's a lot of shared ideas like a shared experience that we have. A lot of people have seen these movies, so it's a really great way to explore these themes. But any anything that you guys can like use to to connect it to things that are happening, I I, I really appreciate that. So thank you, that helps me understand it. You're welcome. Yeah. One of the themes that Zizek often talks about and that comes up in this movie is uh, the following. The problem today is how to enjoy. This would be compared to in the past that you wouldn't have the ability to get the things that you needed or wanted, but now the problem is how to enjoy the things that you really should enjoy or that you're supposed to enjoy. You know, the, Previously we had, I think I mentioned it, the work ethic was part of who you needed to be. You needed to work hard, and that's how you were a good citizen. Yeah. Nowadays, we also have that you are supposed to enjoy certain things, and that's also part of being a good citizen. And I, I think this is very interesting because it ties in with a lot of modern functions, including those of us who work in salaried positions, where more and more you're staying later or coming in early or taking work home with you. This, I think, is uh, part of the problem of how to enjoy because it's, it's the, the creep of work into your regular life. Mm -hmm. It's the, the function that, you know, because of your own guilt, you can't stop working, but because of your guilt, it's hard to stop working and also enjoy. Like, you're supposed to stop and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there isn't a time for enjoyment. Like, uh, <laughs> we'd mentioned uh, Nicole Shippen's, or we did an episode of Nicole Shippen's book, Decolonizing Time. Yeah, that, uh, you know, hits on, hits on just the fact that we don't have time to do what we want anyway. Yeah, we don't have time, and yet commercialism sets up commodities to he talks about this with coca-cola um i think he just plays a commercial right and yep. then he talks about, but how um, commercialism sets up you to desire to desire to you just to continue to want things and to want things in the ab abstract and you talking about this um makes me think of how the the old the, the motto you know um life liberty and the pursuit of happiness it used to be life liberty and the pursuit of property um and they're not that different really when you think about it but there is an ideological shift there um property in in a lot of cases nowadays in this culture is related to happiness having more stuff is is part of pursuing happiness enjoying yourself is be, because you consume uh you know entertainment or or you know whatever your hobbies are and those kinds of things um but that was a really interesting idea to me that in order to keep this this commercialism engine running, you need to sell people on the idea that they will always desire. And desiring 
to desire <laughs> is a good thing. Um, and that kind of blew me away because, of course, that's never said, ex no one would say that explicitly. One, it's a complicated, weird, it's kind of an awkward thing to think about, like, or articulate, um, at least for me, maybe. It was, it was good for, it was easy for Zizek. He articulated it pretty well. <laughs> but but also, you don't want people to realize that's what they're trying to do, that they they have an idealized form of satisfaction that they can never reach, that that idea of a, of the perfect sip of Coke that you're looking for probably doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll never get that, but you keep taking sips because you are, you're sold a bill that says that's what you're looking for, and that's what you'll... F find question mark yeah yeah on this same topic there's a uh, a great book not even a marxist book but um one that might be interesting to leftists is one of naomi klein's first and earliest books she's the person that did the book on disaster capitalism and now she has a new one on the environment uh called this changes everything but one of her first books was called no logo hmm. it was kind of about advertising and uh, consumerism and also like the sweatshops that are actually tied to the real production of commodities. Mm. One of the interesting things about that book is she goes through how in the 80s and, and kind of around that time, there was a big shift in advertising where you were no longer really selling a commodity. You, what you really had to do was sell an idea, mm -hmm. a lifestyle. Yeah. And, and part of selling an idea or a lifestyle is you never have enough of an idea or a lifestyle. You can have enough shoes. You can have enough you know, beverages or whatever, cans of soda, but you can never have enough of a lifestyle. You can never be too successful, too athletic, too sexy, whatever right. you're trying to be. That's what they have to sell you as the commodity. In the more insidious side, the converse of that is like with cologne, it, you, you're selling the lifestyle of being more sexually attractive and finding more, more potential partners. But the, the sneaky underlying message is that right now that you are not sexy enough and you lack something. And that's, yeah, I, I think it's a good point to bring up. Like, because you can always get somewhere, you can, you can always kind of feel bad about yourself for not having more, especially when it's out there and other people can just go get it too. And they're getting more than you. you know, they're getting those things. And you can visit. We're very visual creatures. You see them in those commercials getting those things. Right. And it's very, it's, I can see why it's motivating. I want to be interesting. Therefore, I will drink Dos Equis because that will make me more interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a sick part of our culture that we've developed a society that relies so heavily on advertising. And that what advertising now inherently tries to do is to tell you that you're not good enough in all these different ways. Like a major part of what makes our economy run is convincing people that they're bad right now and that mm -hmm. they need to fix something about themselves that they may or may not actually really need to fix. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. Diet fads. That's that's one that I always think is interesting because I am not um, the shapeliest of people. I'm, you know, I'm not in great shape, but. Uh, I was having a conversation with a young coworker who was taking some diet pill that was supposed to be like some plant fiber stuff that was supposed to expand in your stomach to make you feel more full so you didn't eat as much. Whoa. And I'm like, okay, that's insane. You're starving yourself to death with that. Also, eat slightly less, healthier, and get regular exercise. I'm like... It's not like you don't need secret diet pills. There's a formula. If you want to be healthier and lose weight, you just consume a little less calories, get a little bit more nutritious stuff, and regularly work. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, you know, it's something people have known for ever, <laughs> I'm guessing. But it's always sold as, you know, a different, oh, you need, you're never thin enough. You're never going to do it and let's take all these expensive pills and whatnot that aren't actually going to solve your problem because then mm -hmm. you need to try more another one and and i mean people exist with body dysmorphia where they and i'm sure that is a very complex state of mind board but they where they can't they literally cannot see what their body looks like and they'll they will um not be able to they'll always think that they're too fat even yeah. as they're they're dying of malnutrition and and that's i bet i mean so sort of 
a social extension of probably some of the outcomes. And I'm sure that when that happens, there's a lot at work there. It's probably a very complex condition. Um, but you, you, there's a line you can draw between those two dots when you have a culture who's constantly saying these things, and then we also have a culture who constantly um, w- we're worried about girls being like being objectified, but we have, we see them pushed constantly to be pretty, and to feel like being pretty is one of the main assets that they should consider part of their self worth. Like these things have connections in the real world, and they don't like that's what I think is important to talking about these. Like it's a commercial. People see commercials all the time. We're normalized to it. You don't think that it actually has a practical part in your life and it actually like holds sway, but it really changes. It can change who you are and what you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whether body dysmorphia is caused by capitalism, who knows? <laughs> right. But yes. it's, there's certainly, it's not helping. Yeah. And it, not only is it not helping, but it's it's sick the way that it takes advantage of people mm-hmm. and and tells them that they're bad and wrong and should be ashamed and that only if they achieve some ridiculous, sometimes unachievable ideal can they really be a, a good and accepted person and they're going to make a good buck off of you while you oh, yeah. try to do that. Sometimes I try to think about these larger abstract concepts as a person in my life. And if a person in my life acted this way, manipulated me, constantly made me feel bad to do, to do so that I would be more apt to do what they wanted and get money off me, that's a sociopath that you don't want around you. And it's certainly not a, a on, in like a categorical sense something you just want a part, a pervasive part of your culture. And I, I don't know, it probably is very reductionist for me to put it in those terms, but it sometimes does help me when you, especially when I'm thinking about like larger um, decisions like like the refugee crisis right now where we have a lot of governors basically towing a party line and pretending like they um, can stop refugees from coming and trying to get into fear mongering and 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 appeal to their constituents without actually ha- doing anything because they know they don't have the power to keep people out of their states. Um, to me, I try to think about that if there was a person in my neighborhood <laughs> and like and there were people I was going to help and 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 when you know the facts, you you realize that the refugee crisis is a refugee crisis. It is not a a a, a um, national security risk. I mean, fifty percent of them are children, and thirty percent are women, and they're vetted usually for more than a year. And we're going to take eleven thousand of them, and that's very very small. Like uh, if I thought of a person acting like that on my street, I would I would really really not trust that person anymore like it, it's little things like that and it, sometimes it helps me and in this movie he puts it into terms of pop culture um but sometimes it just helps me to put it into terms of what if a human acted that way like if you had somebody who was like oh man you're kind of fat though. oh you why don't you give me five bucks so you don't go yeah. buy that burrito and you know i gotta move some boxes that's some exercise yeah. like something like that Another way that advertising plays into the support of capitalism is not just by the selling of commodities, but also to reinforce the idea that problems are solved on an individual level. Hmm. So when an advertisement is made, it's saying you individually have a problem, and the way you solve it is by buying this thing. Well, that plays into the fact that it's your choice whether or not to solve the problem, that all, all problems, and, and, or at least the ones that are worth talking about, are all individual problems. And the way that you solve them is by working hard to make enough money so that you can mm. afford this thing. And that translates into people not understanding social problems. So that when we see something that is a problem at a societal level, so many people want to look at it and say, well, why doesn't that person just act the way they're supposed to act or why don't they just work harder or why don't you know why don't they get a different job you know you can apply it to almost anything you know why why did that person get assaulted by the police well maybe they weren't doing everything that they were supposed to do Mm -hmm. or why why does that person want fifteen dollars an hour well maybe they should work harder and get a better job you you can basically make any social problem disappear by pretending it's an individual problem. And I think advertising plays into that. It reinforces that. That's really interesting. I never thought about that. Also, I gotta say, on a very literal level for what he's talking about, after the first time I saw this movie, I can no longer have a beverage I enjoy without Mm -hmm. thinking 
about how it goes from the sublime to excremental. It never can hit that uh, that idealized thing in my head, and that kind of drives me nuts. Yeah, and when I, there are times where I have had a very good soft drink, um, non-brand specific soft drink, uh, and I. And I really, there are times where I'll think that, oh, that was really good, but it's always after the fact. And I was mm-hmm. kind of just thinking about it. There's never, there's really is never that moment where you're get, attaining what you think, like what you are being sold as what you'll attain. Yeah. He talked about the ode to joy mm-hmm. um, at one point. And the thing I thought was interesting here, and I don't remember how he connected it to this. Maybe you guys can recall. But he was talking about how ideology can't just be meaning. It can't just be like a set of thoughts about the world. It has to be open enough to encompass anything that happens. It has to be able to be a complete worldview, a complete filter you see everything through, like like in They Live. Um, anything that would enter that world, it has to be able to translate it into this current ideology. So it's, it's sort of like an amoeba seeks to en- encompass anything that, that uh, gets into its environment. Um, and that is dangerous because ideologies are almost, it'd be fine if they were neutral, if they were just a certain way that came about of seeing the world, but they're almost never neutral, is the point he makes. Um, They almost always have a slant to want you to believe something in a particular way to maybe your disadvantage, but definitely to the advantage of someone else. And that's why it's important to realize that you have this filter. One of the interesting parallels with Ode to Joy, because one of his points with it is that all of these different groups that felt very, very mm, differently, right. all appropriated it as, a, as their official theme from the far mm-hmm. right wing to left wingers and, and all folks in between. It was just such a compelling composition that so many people took it on and, and used it as part of their ideology. I think the film that's the parallel with that is Jaws, mm. where he mentions that Fidel Castro thought of it as a wonderful anti-capitalist movie because Jaws represents American capitalism and see all these poor Americans being eaten alive by their system, Mm -hmm. whereas people in America saw it as, oh, you know, it's the the immigrants or whatever, or it's, you know, the, the mother on welfare, whatever. You can take anything that you don't like and say, that's Jaws, mm-hmm. and we're all afraid of it because it's going to tear down our society. Because even one of the strongest evidence that it's a critique on capitalism in Jaws is that they keep the beach open to not lose money from tourism. Because they want to close the beach to save people's lives, but I think the mayor says they want to keep the beach open because you've got to keep those businesses making money. Um, and so you're like, oh, that's an indictment on capitalism. But it also... If you're just anti-fascist, it could be like, oh, one man shouldn't have that power. <laughs> like, you could say, like, oh, this is like an anti-fascist movie. Like, you can see it in a, a lot of different ways. And, yeah, that was very interesting. Yeah, the basic idea of that. Because it took me a while watching, especially when we were talking about Rammstein, or Ram, Rammstein, mm-hmm. to really get exactly what he was meaning there. And it's just that you need something that's universal and generic, like joy bad you know like the shark is bad the ode to joy is joyful no one's against good or yeah no one's against good and no one's for bad mm-hmm. like especially in their own mind oh yeah um yeah, and that's all you have that's what it is you just have something that's so generic or i think with ramstein it was you know like the step movements and like the sort of way they the move outfits yeah the well. outfits but it was just sort of like it was generic outfits, you know. They didn't have like swastikas or anything. Like that. I don't know if I agree with him that that's the way to undermine fascism, at least specifically with them. But I, I, I do think that's interesting, and I think that uh, that also really trips people up how ideology is really sort of amorphous like that, mm-hmm. because you have like Fox News doesn't understand that Hitler was not a communist, and that communists and Nazis mm-hmm. aren't the same thing. National socialists. Right, exactly. They're, conf- like, they, I think some of it's hyperbole, Yeah. but I think a lot of it's just honest confusion with them. Like, they don't understand, you know, Hitler took over a party that was, like, a workers' party. Like, they don't understand how that can be different. Right. And I think that's sort of, yeah, just a product of the amorphous nature of ideologies. Another thing I liked about the film was Slavoj's definition of fascism, which I've summarized in my notes as there being a clear hierarchy with modern industry. So, 
hierarchies like feudalism in the past and things like that. Most social systems that have that clear hierarchy are from the past, but married with modern industry. And that there is no class struggle in a fascist society. Mm. And, th and that's why you need to pull in the, the scapegoat, because there always is going to be something that's not right in society. You know, you can never have people that are 100% satisfied all the time. When, you know, and, and we know just you know, from our experience that people reset expectations when, when they are happy all the time or when they're, when they're you know, beaten down all the time. People find happiness in the smallest, most surprising places. In fascism, you, the scapegoats, of course, you know, the minorities, Jews, homosexuals, Anyone socialists. who's not the, the the white race, yeah, including socialists and communists. That was a definition of fascism that I just hadn't thought about before, that it's this ability of having a strict hierarchy married with modern industry and no class struggle. Yeah. M makes it, I feel like that makes a good starting point for anyone who wants to call uh, the places like China... Um, a form of fascism, mm -hmm. or Donald Trump, yeah. Because I mean, that's that's what he's arguing for uh, to go with the American personal. It's all personal things, so there's never a class problem for him. The problem is what he normally says, <laughs> or what he's been saying a lot lately, is Islamic people, Muslims, and Latino people. And then that's that. Their scapegoat. And he's in charge. He's, he's glad it's everyone now. He's smarter than everyone. More clever and more successful. That's why he should be in charge. He should clearly be the person on top. But, yeah. And, but he's very clearly defining an enemy or, or an other that we can get behind together. Yeah. And that's, that jumps back to what um, Zizek, Mr. Z, says about Jaws, too. Is what he was talking about was that, so, like, we all fear. As humans, we just have fears. Um, and the function of the shark in the movie is to unite all the people's fears together and, and so that they can trade their actual fears for the shark. Um, and he, what he was saying was that this is what the Nazis did, like what we've talked about with the Jewish people, where you trade this, you, you create a scapegoat to simplify fear. You take a very complex national situation um, post World War One, and you trade that nuanced complexity for something very simple, concrete that can be acted upon. But better, more important than that, gets people on the same side. They're not thinking about the the superstructure at work. They're not thinking about the government. They're not they're not even worried about their their most of their neighbors. They're worried about a particular type of person, and they can direct all their energy in this very simple, laser focused way. But one of the points he made is that they're not really even closely, even though they're, they're all bunching together on the same side of the field, they're not really connected with each other because they're not actively thinking about this and they're not seeing the world in, in the complex way it deserves and they're actually sort of detaching themselves from each other in kind of dangerous ways. I thought, and I thought that was really interesting. Here's a question I have for you guys about uh, fascism, like specifically with the Nazis. So when I think about something set up like that, my thought is, okay, so if the Nazis be beat, if they weren't beaten and they completed their genocide, wouldn't they then eventually have to move on to something else to be the enemy? Like, isn't that a system where something always needs to be the enemy? Because you never actually get rid of the class antagonisms that exist mm -hmm. there. Yeah. You just pretend they're not there, and you've gotten rid of the scapegoat so wouldn't that just breed like perpetual like oh now it's this and a higher and higher scale perhaps too like <clears throat> yeah you guys have seen or read Watchmen if we're talking about pop culture anyway here yeah I've seen the movie okay yeah the book. A wonderful graphic novel by Alan Moore and the, and the movie is quite good too but the uh, spoiler for this by the way jump ahead like thirty seconds if you don't want to hear this. Um, but the main conceit of the villain in that movie is that he wants to fake an alien invasion to unite the entire world together and this invasion re requires him to make it real to destroy all of new york um, um there would be no actual enemy but it would unite the whole world and stop all wars it would cost millions of lives and people would be lied to and it would be to control them but it would be to cause f uh, peace so it's it's fascist on a very global scale but it has that sort of idea that 
he couldn't probably unite the whole world by just using like ideal a certain race. Not everybody would get behind them. He has to. You have to keep upping the stakes to the point where oh, it has to be something from outside this world. How do you unite the whole world? It has to be something that's not us. That other would constantly have to kind of expand, um, in in a really dangerous way. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, and I mean that goes into like uh, what he was saying about Dark Knight. Because that's, that's exactly like the same thing that he says that the movie is making the point of with Batman and the Two-Face is that, you know, to, in order mm. to save the people, you need a noble lie and a villain as a scapegoat. Yeah. And that, that, that's the whole ideology behind that movie is that it's, it's okay to lie to people if it makes yeah. them yeah. quote-unquote safer. better, safer. Yeah, and the implication there, which Slavoj um, points out, is that people are too dumb to know the truth. They can't handle... They can't handle that truth, so they don't deserve to be told it. Um, and that's, that's what he says. Like, this is an old conservative notion, he says, that the truth is too strong. They need somebody to know it but mask it, is, what, is how he puts it. And, and, yeah, I mean, that is really just treating the people as if they're your, your, your cattle. And they're, they're too dumb to know what they'd want um, for themselves. Right. Well, it's the way our intelligence services operate, too. Like, what do you mean? Everything, like with the military stuff, it's all classified. Even stuff mm. that doesn't make any difference. And they're the ones who get to decide what we should and shouldn't know. They're the ones who get to decide when they want to let us know about, like, ISIS or mm -hmm. something like that. Not, like, when they're helping set them up or things like that. Yeah. But <clears throat> once they become a concern and they want us to be concerned so they can do, you know, it's the manipulation of truth and information so that right. they can get the desired results. When they, yeah. When they want popular favor to support something that the government does now on a wider scale, they'll tell us about it. But yeah, they won't tell us about what, when we're actually supporting the people and they won't give it. And I, I would say that they probably can't have complete transparency if you want, you know, an intelligence network to work. But the fact that let things stay classified for decades, yeah. it's probably not a security risk at that point, guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it, and yeah, I'm sure there's a lot that they could be telling us that they, that right. they just don't. They, they, get to, they get to control that information. So, yeah. Well, like with Chelsea Manning, the stuff that she was thrown in jail for leaking is nothing that posed any sort of intelligence mm -hmm. risk anymore. And it's stuff that people desperately needed to know is that, you know, we had people who were just murdering people who they knew were innocent and laughing about it, mm -hmm. literally laughing about it as they do it. And, you know, like those sort of horrible, terrible revelations, like, and it just gets buried because we don't need to know it. And then people are like, I can't understand why we're not greeted as liberators. <laughs> right. You know. Our narrative of America is very different than the world's narrative, of, of like because yeah. they don't see the things we see. Right. Well, and then those people must be, you know, lesser people probably because they're Muslim because that's the only reason they wouldn't do that. It feeds into that racist, Radical. fascist narrative yeah. as well. Yeah. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.